Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to have you here this morning. I don't know if I was the only one that just saw Anna dancing down the middle of the aisle. Spirit-filled service this morning, amen? Good to have you here this morning. If you're a guest of ours, so I want to say welcome to you. I'm Billy, one of the pastors here at First Baptist. Hopefully everybody was able to grab a worship guide on your way in. Inside there'll be things that are helpful for you throughout the service. Uh, lyrics to the songs and a, a place for uh, prayer requests, things you can pray about. And then there's a few tear-outs in there for you as well that you can uh, fill those out if you're a guest. There's a guest information form. If you uh, have prayer requests, fill those out. And note on there if you want the elders only or the whole church praying for you. You can drop those in the boxes that are by the doors uh, before you leave today. Uh, we're going to start off the service a little bit differently this morning. Uh, we're actually going to uh, recite the Lord's Prayer together. And then after we do the Lord's Prayer, then we'll have a couple guys read uh, from the Old Testament, New Testament, and then we'll get into our songs. So uh, if you're able and willing, please stand. And I'll uh, start to get us going here. And then uh, you just come along and recite it with me if you would, okay? After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The readers will come forward. Lance will be reading out of the Old Testament for you. Tom will be reading out of the New Testament, and then he will pray and ask God to bless our time together. Go ahead, man. Reading out of Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Take the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitants and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, and though a tent remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is filled, the holy seed is its stump. And I'll be reading out of <coughs> Revelation 15, 1 through 4. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues, having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over the image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, 
O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for your word and for the truth of your word. How you give us your word to learn each day. Father, I ask your blessing on this word and I bless your blessing on this service. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Amen. It's good to see you this morning. Are you excited to sing this morning? We really are this morning. This week, if you'll notice, Miss Cindy is out, so Miss Amanda's filling in. She'll be out for a few weeks, but they're going on the, um, work out of town. So uh, be sure to thank Amanda. She's kind of got double duty more than all of us this week. And we have Liam with us again this morning. I know you're all excited about that. And we've been practicing, and we're excited to sing. Join with us as we all sing All Hail the Power of Jesus now.
seated. Uh, Jamie King, one of our elders, is going to come forward and lead us through our corporate prayer time together. If you want to, you can use your worship guide and just turn a couple pages in. You'll see some things that you can pray for when we have the time of silent prayer. But Jamie, I have a few other things for you that you can uh, pray about as well. Before we do our corporate prayer time, I want to read a few verses out of Psalm 135. Starting verse 1. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, you servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to His name, for it is delightful. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for Himself, Israel, as His treasured possession. For I know that the Lord is great, and our Lord is greater than all gods. What an honor and a privilege it is to be here today. Uh, one of the things we like to do during our corporate prayer time is recognize any of our visitors and the church they're visiting from. Because uh, as we go through this, you'll see we pray for a lot of churches, and we'd like to pray for years if uh, we had any visitors here with us that would share the name of their church they're visiting from. Any visitors? All oh, home crowd. That's good. My, my in-laws are here. They're not saying it, but they're here from Arkansas. Say it. Say it. First Baptist Church and Village. Say it. Say it. Say it. Say it. We got one over here, too. Oh. Grace Bottle College Station. That's what Texas is saying in there. We won't move away. Any other visitors? I'd like to ask for extra prayer this week. We lost a junior in high school this week. She had a car accident, and so the whole community is very devastated. One of the other things we do is pray for uh, Grace uh, Christian Church and Steam Hatchie, Brother Carlin. Uh, also, Cornerstone Church, Jacob and Amber, the church plant, Riverside Baptist Church, Live Oak First Baptist Church, Hope Community Church, and Rome International Church. Uh, we also have an unreached people group that we usually pray for each week. Maybe not on the screen this week, but always pray for the unreached. Uh, but just as you go through your week, be praying for the upcoming international students visit, visit next week. Uh, there's a list of things in your worship guide that you can pray for or whatever the Holy Spirit lays on your heart. So we'll take a few moments to pray silently and then uh, after a few minutes I'll close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the day you've given us, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity that we can gather together and praise and worship you, Lord. Lord, we, we pray that the remainder of this service will be honoring and glorifying to you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for our visitors today and the, their churches that they're visiting from, Lord. We pray that you would be with our leaders and uh, be with the saints in those churches, Lord. We pray that they would be uh, lights in their communities, Lord. We pray for 
the loss of the young lady, Lord, we just pray for all those who have lost loved ones that you would be with them as they grieve through that, Lord. And Lord, we pray for those who are sick in our congregation or those who are traveling, Lord. Lord, we lift up our nation, our leaders, our military, and all of our civil servants, Lord. We pray for, for, for protection, for guidance and direction for our country, Lord. And Lord, we just uh, pray for all unreached peoples of the earth and for more missionaries to go. And Lord, I uh, just praise you and thank you for sending Jesus. And Lord, we just uh, now ask that you be with Pastor Billy as he brings the message today, Lord. Help us to to apply it to our lives, Lord, that we can take what we learn and you speaking through Him, Lord, today and take it out with us as we go. God, we love you because you first loved us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Would you stand with us as we continue singing about the holiness of God this morning?
Wondering, yes, Jamie and I did call one another this morning and ask what shirt we were wearing. <laughs> you can see, which is true of us, mine is a little faded, I think, and his is brighter, so it matches us. Let me invite you to take your copy of God's Holy inerrant, inspired, and living word, and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 18. 2 Samuel chapter 18. If you do not have a Bible with you today, there should be some pew Bibles in front of you or beside you. Turn to page, around page 269 in the Pew Bible that should be close to 2 Samuel chapter 18. Titled the sermon this week, There is no king like the king of kings. 
There is no king like the king of kings. I once had a friend of mine say to me, what is true in the light is true in the dark. What is true in the light is still true in the darkness. We had been in country for just a few months, and things weren't going very well. We were overseas, and therefore our second term, trying to do work unto the Lord, try to reach people with the gospel, and it seemed like everything that could go wrong did go wrong, including the team that we joined. We were having team conflict. Now, you would think those who have been sent out from churches to go be ministers of the gospel around the world, that they would be so mature and they would never struggle with things. Well, if you've read the New Testament closely, you see that even Paul and Barnabas had some issues with one another, and, or at least disagreed on some issues, and parted ways and went separate ways when it came to their missionary journeys. So we're in country and everything is going to be great. This is our second term, so we've, been, we've had one term already, so now we have expectations of what life's going to be like overseas. That's one of the most dangerous things you can possibly do, is set expectations and hold tightly to them. And you know we do this every single day. We set expectations all the time, and then we put our hope in those expectations, and then it doesn't happen that way, and then hope deferred makes the heart sick. And we're discouraged. So we're there in country. We're thinking we know how everything's going to go. Language is difficult. Teaming is difficult. And I get a call from my mother. And she says they found a, a spot on her leg. Looks to be pretty bad. It's spread. It's going to be a pretty serious surgery. Please be praying. We hung up the phone. And I looked at Heather and I said, maybe we made the wrong decision coming. Maybe we misread what God was telling us. All these things are going wrong. And my mom has this surgery coming with cancer. I think we, we should go back. Now, if you had asked us three months before that, we were certain we were supposed to go. But now the darkness had come. And we had, or I had, forgotten what was true in the light was still true in the darkness. Emotions were driving what I was thinking. Emotions in themselves are, are not bad, they are a gift from God but they can get us in trouble. They're very good in that they, they point to things that we, we cherish and we care about. But all too often we have emotions and they end up driving what we do or what we think. In 2 Samuel chapter 18, we're going to see how David is at a point and has been at a point to where he allows emotions to drive his thinking. He doesn't think clearly because of emotions. For those who haven't been with us, we've been walking through 2 Samuel. And King David has a son named Absalom. And Absalom has decided that he is going to take the throne from his father. Now David is God's anointed king. And so it is treason, it is heavenly treason to go against God's anointed king. But he's deciding to overthrow his father. And for those of you who've been studying with us, you see that as that happened, as he was getting his support, David responded poorly, driven by emotion, and, and left the city. And as he, he left the city, he ran into a few folks along the way, some who were supportive of him, some who were against him. And he went 
east and he's gone far. He's gone out of the promised land. God's anointed king has left the land when he shouldn't have driven by emotion. A lot of this all comes from his own sin that we saw. His sin with Bathsheba and murdering her husband. The guilt that he's been feeling has just been driving him to where he's not the same man that he was that we, we saw together in 1 Samuel and in the early parts of 2 Samuel. And although he left, he left some spies behind. He left his kind of CIA operatives in the city to give him information about what Absalom was going to do. And this system has worked perfectly, and he has found out that Absalom's coming to attack, and his operatives, one in particular, bought him a little more time because there was a possibility that Absalom, as he had gotten to the city, he, his advisor, Ahithophel, the, the main guy that everyone loved to listen to, had said, we need to go and we need to get David now. He has just left the city. He's not ready. Let's take him out. And if we take him out, everyone else will follow you, Absalom. You'll be the king, and there won't be a need for more bloodshed. But that other operative that David left behind, Hushai, he gave different advice, and we saw last week that the Lord was absolutely in control of all those conversations, making sure that the Lord's will would play out and that David would remain king. And so he bought him a little time, and he played to Absalom's pride, and he said, here's what you need to do. Go ahead and get all of Israel to come, and you lead the army out. Don't, don't send somebody else to go kill David quickly. Oh, no, 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 no. You are the king. Besides, David's pretty good with warfare, so let's, let's do it this way. And he bought. He bought in. Absalom said, okay, let's do it. And word got to David, and David's a mighty warrior. He's had a lot of experience over the years, so he prepares for battle. And that's where chapter 18 picks up for us today. So let's walk through the text. Verse by verse, I, I do have some things I hope that you will see that will be helpful for you and for me as we consider those in the text today. 2 Samuel chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. Then David mustered the men who were with him and set over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. So David has a lot of people with him still. Absalom's gaining a lot of ground as well, a lot of momentum. But you can see here David has quite the numbers. And David sent out the army, one-third under the command of Joab, one-third of the command of Abishai, the son of Zariah, Joab's brother, and one-third under the command of Ittai the Gittite. And the king said to the men, I myself will go out with you. A couple things to note right here. We have, he divides the army into thirds going to give him an advantage over his son Absalom. As they're coming, they're going to attack him from different ways with these different commanders. Joab, we've seen over and over again. This is his nephew, this guy. Oh, man, he's loyal. He is loyal to David. Not certain he knows the Lord. Probably not, but he is loyal to the king. He's been the, the commander of the army in the past. This other one, Abishai, we find out is his brother, he came into play before when, with Joab, they murdered somebody that they weren't supposed to. So he's the commander of the other army. And then we have this third guy, Ittai the Gittite. Some of you remember him from just a few chapters ago. He's not even from Israel. He's from a different nation. He's the one that came, and David was like, wait, you just got here. We're all leaving because my son Absalom's coming. You should just stay here. You just got here recently. And he said, oh, no, wherever the king goes, I go. This foreigner is loyal to the king. So now we have, David has his army, we're divided up into thirds, and we have our leaders of each part. But he says this, I'm going to go with you. Remember, that's what kings did. Kings would go out and they would lead the army. But there was a time that David didn't go out. He was supposed to, and some of you will remember that. It's when he stayed home, started relaxing, hanging out on the rooftop, saw Bathsheba, and we all know it went downhill from there. Thankfully, David's not making that mistake again. He's not going to stay back and get in trouble. He's going to be the king that he needs to be. He's going to go out with them. Now look what happens. Verse 3, but the men said, you shall not go out. For if we flee, they will not care about us. 
If half of us die, they will not care about us. But you are worth 10,000 of us. Therefore, it is better that you send us help from the city. No, 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 king. No, 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 you have to stay. This whole thing depends on the fact that if you live, you have to live. If they, they take you out, kind of like the advisor, like a chapter before had said, let's go take out David because then we'll have the victory, they know it's true too. You have to live. You can't go with us. Stay back. Give us support from the city. The king said to them, whatever seems best to you, I will do. So the king stood at the side of the gate while all the army marched out by hundreds and by thousands. The king is not in the war now. And the king ordered Joab and Abishai and Ittai, watch this, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And, notice what the text says, and all the people heard when the king gave orders to all the commanders about Absalom. Everyone heard it. Be gentle with the young man Absalom. Be gentle with my son. Show of hands, how many of you think that Absalom deserves to be dealt with in a gentle way with what he's been doing? Be gentle with my son. So, verse 6. The army went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. And the men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David, and the loss there was great on that day, 20,000 men. Again, if they would have taken the advice of the other guy, yes, David would have been killed, but that, not that many people would have died probably. Because it went to war, this many die. But David is victorious. Just as Ahithophel, the guy who had given that counsel, he knew that would happen because David was a mighty warrior. He knew how to fight. He knew how to get his men together. He knew the terrain. The battle spread all over the face of all the country. And watch this. The forest devoured more people that day than the sword. Wow. And Absalom happened, when we see that, just, just do this, happened, right? Last week, what did we learn? Who's in control of this whole thing? God is. Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. And his head caught fast in the oak. And he was suspended between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him went on. Can you picture that? Some say that maybe the branches caught him kind of like this because it was, again, real thick, caught him by the throat and he was hanging there. I like the other version. His hair. Some of you have heard that before, his hair, right? Remember, remember he's the guy, right, with his flowing hair? They would cut it at the end of the year and weigh it. That's how amazing his hair was. See, we see what, we see what the Bible says, right? Let me see what it says. This is what I've been waiting for. This is, this is the verse. This is the passage. All of you brothers who uh, maybe don't have as much hair as Absalom, you are blessed. Don't worry about it. <laughs> He's riding a mule. He's going through, and whether it's his neck or his hair or whatever, he gets held up and hanged right there. And the mule just continues on. God doesn't need anyone to do what he sets out to do. And a certain man saw it and told Joab. Joab's one of those leaders of one of those armies, the one who kind of goes off. He's loyal to David, but he's pretty intense. Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. <laughs> Not the interesting news. What? Joab said to the man who told him, What? You saw him? Why then did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have been glad to give you ten pieces of silver and a belt. But the man said to Joab, Even if I felt in my hand the weight of a thousand pieces of silver, I would not reach out my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king commanded you and Abishai and Atai, 
For my sake, protect the young man, Absalom. Wow. That soldier, he's listening, right? He was paying attention. We know everyone heard this. So surely Joab right now is going to be like, you know what? You're right. You're right. He did say that. We've got to go help him down and bring him to his dad. But if you know Joab, that's not what you're expecting. If you've been watching Joab, you're like, uh-oh, what's coming? On the other hand, if I had dealt treacherously against his life and there was nothing hidden from the king, then you yourself would have stood aloof. I know what you would have done, Joab. If I had killed him, you would have acted like you had nothing to do with it and you would have turned me into the king. When the king got upset, you would have said, it was that dude right there. He's, like, He's kind of wise. He's watching for, out for himself here as well. Here's Joab's response. I will not waste time like this with you. And he took three javelins in his hand and thrust them into the heart of Absalom while he was still alive in the oak tree. And ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, who would have been around him, they surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. That's how the king's son dies. Hanging, suspended in a tree, by either his neck or his hair, three javelins in his heart or in his chest, and just hacked and killed. Do you remember what Nathan said to David? Because of your sin, the sword will not leave your house. He's already lost another son, Abnon, who Absalom killed when Abnon did a terrible thing with Absalom's sister, which they're all related under David. It's a mess. God's word is coming true again. Over and over we see God's word come true. So then Joab blew the trumpet and the troops came back from pursuing Israel. For Joab restrained them. He also knew, well, Absalom's dead so we don't need to keep going. We don't need to keep fighting anymore. There's only one king. It's David. So he blows the trumpet and watch this. And they took Absalom and threw him in a great pit in the forest and raised over him a very great heap of stones. And all Israel fled, everyone to his home. Traitors get put in situations like that with stones over them. Throw, dig a pit and throw stones on them. What's interesting is with the way that Absalom's been acting, he should have been stoned before, actually. He should have been killed according to the law. The way that he had been acting, he should have been stoned already. <coughs> Listen to this out of Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. Now remember, the book of the law informs the prophets and the historical books. And the king, when a new king would come to the throne, they were supposed to do something with the book of the law. Does anyone remember? Let me know. What were they supposed to do with the book of the law? Anyone know? A good king. What were they supposed to do? Copy. They're supposed to copy the whole book. Okay? Here's what Deuteronomy 18 says. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton, a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. It goes on to say this. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury, it, bury him the same day. For hanged... For a hanged man is cursed by God. That's in the same passage. Absalom, where was he at? What was he doing? He's hanged in a tree. He should have been stoned a long time ago. But David wouldn't do that. See, David's parenting, he's the, the, the type of parent that will not discipline his kids. We saw the same thing with Amnon, his other son when he did that terrible thing with Tamar? He did nothing. 
That's why Absalom felt like he had to do something. He did nothing. He's done nothing with Absalom. A little bit further on in 1 Kings, listen to this. Adonijah, another one of David's sons, he says this later in the story. He says, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. His father had never at any time, listen to this, his father, meaning David, had never at any time displeased him by asking, why have you done thus so and so? He was a very handsome man and he was born next after Absalom. David never went to his son and said, why have you done this thing? He never said anything that would displease his kids. This is the idea of just letting your kids run however they want to do it. If you do that, you will lead them to destruction. Proverbs 19, 18 says, Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. If you will not discipline your children, you are putting them to death. You are setting your, your heart on putting them to death. Many of you I've heard over and over say one of the things that you can easily see in our culture that does not exist anymore is that kids are not disciplined anymore. Let me challenge you, parents. Go back to the text. Go back to the scriptures and figure out what does it mean to biblically discipline your kids. Let me challenge you, those who have your opportunities now passed. Your kids are out of the house, but you do have grandkids. You pray for them, and you wisely, gently talk with your kids. And here's the thing. You may want to start off that conversation with a bit of humility. Hey, there are times that we failed as parents. We didn't do a good job disciplining like we should have. Please forgive us for that. And let me encourage you to go to the text and look. Nobody thinks, well, I just want to point my kids to death. But there's a whole way of thinking now that you're, you're to be your kid's friend and not their parent. That's not what they need. This is true of all discipline. And the Lord does it with us. The Lord disciplines those that he loves. He points to earthly discipline for us to understand it. It's even why you have churches that ultimately have to exercise church discipline at times. You have a church that's not willing to do that. You have a church or you have leaders who do not love their members. They do not love their members. Because church discipline is given to help bring people, restore them back. And if a congregation is not willing to do it, if you as believers are not willing to do that with others, then you don't love them really. Not according to the scriptures. You do not. Absalom's dead. Oh, how it could have been different if David would have acted differently. He's under this great heap of stones. Everyone has now fled away. Look at verse 18. Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and set up for himself a pillar that is in the king's valley. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. He actually did have three sons, but apparently they died as they were young. And so he says, no one's going to remember me. So I better set up my own altar so people will remember me. You know what? There's somebody else that did the same thing. If you remember back in 1 Samuel, his name was Saul. There's so many parallels between what happened with Saul and David and Absalom and David. No one's going to remember me anyway, so I better put up my own pillar. He called the pillar after his own name and is called Absalom's monument to this day. He set up a monument to himself and he ends up in a pit with stones over him. Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, he was one of those informants that was running around information earlier. He was one of the ones that would kind of run and help let David know what was happening. Now, all of a sudden, he comes into the scene. Let me run and carry news to the king that the Lord has delivered him from the hand of his enemies. Oh, we got we to gotta tell David that, that, that we've won, that God's delivered him. And Joab said to him, you are not carrying news today. You may carry news another day, but today you shall carry no news because the king's son is dead. See, Joab knows what's up. 
He knows that David, right? He's sending out the troops. What's David say? Hey, hey, as you guys are going, be gentle with my son, David's focus. Joab knows it. Then Joab said to the Cushite, go tell the king what you have seen. And the Cushite bowed before Joab and ran. You see, Joab likes Ahimaaz. He's like, you're not going. <laughs> kind of like when, when something bad happens, you have a bunch of kids. Someone breaks something, someone gets hurt. It's like, who's going to go tell mom? Ugh. Who's going to go tell dad? I don't know. Who does he like most? You, you, you seem to be the sweetest. You go tell. Joab's like, no, 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 Ahimaaz, you're not going. We're going to send this guy who's not even really a part of us. Not really true Israel here. He can go. Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said again to Joab, Come what may, let me also run after the Cushite. And Joab said, Why will you run, my son, seeing that you have no reward for the news? Why do you want to go tell the king if you're not going to get something out of it? See, Joab's mind is always thinking that way. Come what may, he said, I will run. So he said to him, Run. Then Ahimaaz ran by the way of the plain and outran the Cushite. He started after him, but he, he was faster, or he at least knew another path. Maybe he went the longer way, but he's faster. Now watch it, now, now, the, now the scene shifts to David. Now David was sitting between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof of the gate by the wall, and when he lifted up his eyes and looked, he saw a man running alone. The watchman called out and told the king, and the king said, if he is alone, there is news in his mouth. If it's a whole bunch of guys coming, that means they're, they're running from war. If it's one guy, he's got news for us. And he drew nearer and nearer. The watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called to the gate and said, See, another man running alone, the king said. He also brings news. We got two guys coming. We're getting two separate, maybe, maybe two of the same news, two separate news. But let's see what happens. The watchman said, I think the, the running of the first is the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. Hey, they all know what the guy runs like. That's interesting. I guess he does it often. And this king said, watch this, he is a good man, so he comes with good news. The good man brings good news. And Ahimaaz cried out to the king, All is well. And he bowed down before the king with his face to the earth and said, Blessed be the Lord your God who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my Lord the king. Oh, that would have been good news to hear, wouldn't it? Oh, the Lord has delivered us. What does the king say right away? And the king said, it, Is it well with the young man Absalom? Yeah, yeah, it's great that, that God just delivered us. But is it okay with, with the young man Absalom? Ahimaaz answered, When Joab sent the king's servant, your servant, I saw a great commotion, but I do not know where it was. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He just told you, you don't want to go tell the king that news. And he gets there and he's like, ah, I want to tell him the good news. <laughs> you see what I'm he wants to go, he wants the reward, he wants to tell him the good news. The king's like, what about my son? Oh man, I don't even know what happened. There was something going on over there, commotion. Well, I'm not sure. And the king said, turn aside and stand here. So he turned aside and stood still. And behold, the Cushite came. And the Cushite said, I'm just, I, they got to be panting, right? I just feel like what they're running. Good news for my lord, the king. For the Lord has delivered you this day from the hand of all those, all who rose up against you. And the king said to Cushite, is it well with the young man Absalom? Now watch how he answers. It's interesting. And the Cushite answered, may the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up against you for evil be like that young man. Whoa. What a true statement, though. You go up against the king, the anointed one, all of their ends should be like that. All of them should end that way. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I have died instead of you? Absalom, my son, my son. A few things I want you to take away from the text today. 
different players in the, in the game, in the text, let me just point out a positive and a negative from each one that we saw through the text. Absalom, who's now dead, very much like Saul, let me warn you first, let me warn you with this, do not fall because of your pride. He ultimately has fallen because of his pride, even, I think, the pride of his hair. But Don't fall because of your pride. On the positive note with Absalom, it's interesting, he doesn't speak in this text. He is not, he, he's central in one sense of what happens, but all that happens with him is this mule leaves. But he builds his own altar. Let me first say, are you working hard to build your, your own altar? Don't think in terms of building an altar, trying to make a name for yourself. Think in terms of legacy. Think of terms of legacy in your family, being those who love the Lord and pass it down generation to generation. Think in terms of legacy in this church as a member here that you make this church, you help make this church better for those to come after us, like the saints who are here before us, the saints who purchased this land, the saints who built this building, the saints who've been here before us, those who've done work to be a light in this community. Let's, let's think in terms of legacy. So with Absalom, don't let your pride bring you down. Think in terms of legacy. He, 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 it was okay that he wanted to have an influence in the future, but it was just off with him. With Ahimaaz, the guy who ran fast to tell, let me encourage you, be quick to run and tell the good news. That's a good thing. Be quick to run and tell the good news. Want to do that. Be also willing to tell the bad news. Be also willing to tell the bad news. That would be a positive and a negative from what I see in his life here. Joab, the guy who ended up killing Absalom, right? He's actually really sober-minded, meaning he sees the world the way it is. He knows the best thing to happen, what should have happened, what needs to happen, is that Absalom needs to die. Well, you, you take him down and you bring him to the king? Has David handled that well in the past? Absolutely not. That's why they're in this situation. He understands Absalom needs to die. So let me encourage you, positive side, be sober-minded. See the world the way that it is. Don't walk around trying to see the world that way that you would hope it would be. See it how it is. But at the same time, on a negative side, you need to obey God and those that God has put over you. See, he's willing to just go off and do whatever he wants to do. He sees the world rightly, but he won't submit to God or to those who are above him. Who has God put above you in your life? You need to submit to those. See the world sober-mindedly and submit to those God has put in your life. With David... Use the gifts and experiences God has given you. You see that in the text. He, the, the military experience, you see that David, he does some good things again. He's willing to go back out. He, he's changed, right? Before he wouldn't go out as a king to battle. Now he wants to go out. There's some good things. Use those that God has given you. On the downside, do not be driven by emotion. To where you can't even rejoice that God has delivered you because you're too concerned about your evil son that's been trying to kill you. You cannot see things rightly. Joab's seeing it rightly. He's not. Do not be driven by emotion. Some of you don't realize how often you do this. You make decisions all the time driven by emotion. When we were overseas, as I start off the sermon with, I was being driven by emotion. I don't feel like I'm supposed to be here. Some of you are those people. You're, you're like me. You're the people you start off your sentences with, I feel like this. I feel like, I feel like, some of you are the other side, you're the I think. I think this, okay? What's dangerous is the feel like. And if the think like doesn't match the scriptures, that's dangerous too. But the feel like sometimes is so real, so powerful for us that we'll, we will disregard what the word of God says because I feel like this. I feel like I care about this person, so I should be with them. They're not a Christian. Word of God says you shouldn't. Yeah, but I feel like I should. Well, you feel wrong. You feel wrong. That's not what the Word of God says. I felt like things were going poorly where we were. I felt like maybe we made a mistake. I felt like we needed to come back to America. 
And I called the elders from the church that sent us. And they said, absolutely not. What you have been sent to do matches with God's word. We as a church, as elders, we prayed, we fasted together, we laid hands on you, we sent you out. There's nothing yet with your mom that she needs you at this point. She's not even saying come back. She's saying stay. She doesn't need you yet. She has the Lord. She has family. It's okay. I wanted a way out because it was getting hard. God, give me something here. Maybe I've made the wrong decision. No, 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 no. What was true in the light is true in the dark. Don't be like David and be driven by your emotions. And then last, the Cushite. The guy who ran and gave the good news and he spoke the truth and he, he did it in a gracious way. So let me encourage you, speak truth in a gracious way like he does. It's incredible. It says, he comes from a, the Cushite, he's Cushite, he's from the grandson of Noah, Cush, and he comes from that line. Again, not cared about by Joab, but he speaks the truth in a gracious way. The, the, the thing I would, I would say to you though, just be careful who you trust. Joab told him, yeah, go tell the king, you go. Now he's obeying, which is good, but be careful who you trust. That would be the, the warning I have. Friends, this text again shows us that we do not and cannot trust in kings or leaders to be our savior. Can I say during election season, election time, be careful be careful. You stay informed, do your part, vote. Watch your heart. Don't put your trust in anyone else other than the king. We need a king who is in control. We need a king who isn't sinfully driven by emotion, but his emotion matches truth perfectly. We need a, a king that will discipline us because he loves us, we need a king who isn't weighed down by his own sin like David. All this comes from David's sin. He's weighed down by it. We need a king that has no sin. And we, like David, need a king who takes away our guilt and forgives us. Praise be to God we have that king. Amen? Amen. The true son of David. The root of Jesse. The holy stump that we read in Isaiah. That Jesus is the one with his death on that cross and his resurrection is the perfect king. Let's follow him. Father, thank you for this day. We thank you for this text. Lord, we're thankful for the things that we see. Lord, there's so much more in here that, that, that I've not uh, talked about today. Lord, I pray that you would, by your spirit, open our eyes to more. I pray you would help us to set our focus on the true king. Lord, but, but learning from these, these different men in the story, Lord, help us to walk in faithfulness. Help us to see that we need a holy king who is completely separate and different. And then, Lord, as we, we look to you, as you are holy, you call us to be holy, to be separate, to be different. Lord, would you guide us in that? Would you find those today who are here who have not trusted, Lord, they have not made, been made holy. They are not separate. They are not saved. I pray that they would trust in Jesus. And for those who have, would you sanctify us, set us apart, continue to work in us in such a way that we are different and more like Jesus every day. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Wayne, to come forward. If uh, Ian can come up, you can. And Brother Jamie McCain can come up as well. We're going to take the Lord's Supper now. So what we want to do is just take a few moments now, um, encourage you to uh, ask the Lord to, to search your heart during this time. Uh, this is something that we do. We do this in remembrance of uh, Jesus' death and in our place for our sins. And so it's a remembrance, and it's a proclamation at the same time. So if you're not a follower of Jesus, this is just something for you to observe today, not for you today. But if you are a baptized follower of Jesus who has a good standing in your church, then we encourage you, please, take the, the Lord's Supper with us today. But we're supposed to do it according to 1 Corinthians 11. We're supposed to do it first with asking God to search our heart, making sure we're in a good spot before we actually take it. If there, likewise, if there's somebody here that you have issue with, let me just encourage you to go to them and just say, hey, please forgive me, or I forgive you. And we can, you, can, you can iron out the details later. Please don't get into a huge discussion right now about that. But you can hammer, uh, hammer out those details later. 
take the Lord's Supper, and then you can uh, handle that later. So we're going to prepare things up here for you. You guys just go take a moment and ask the Lord to search your heart. Receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's cup before it comes. All right, so we'll uh, have you guys start in the, in the wings and then the front rows and work your way back. Uh, as you're waiting for your turn, please feel free to read Scripture over the congregation. If you're not able to come forward, um, just wait till everyone's gone, and then we'll come to you with the um, Okay. All right, let's go ahead and stand. We're going to do a response song, one that you probably know, but we haven't done as a response generally. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Repeat that. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, 